Hey guys, it's Jovan again. Before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to share with you all that in this episode, we had a chance, Carmen and I, to interview Dr. Sue Ojigir. And she has a lot of different things going on. Um, she's in pharmacogenomics, holistic health. She used to work in retail. And she's releasing a new uh, children's book titled The Pharma Heroes, The Power of Precision Medicine. And this book actually releases today, March 20th. So if you have a chance, definitely go ahead and check us out, buy a copy. If you have any children, it's a super cute book. I had the opportunity to get a get a pre-order copy and go through it. Super colorful, great way to introduce pharmacy and pharmacogenomics to children. So definitely go cop this book. You can go to Amazon.com and just search for The Pharma Heroes, The Power of Precision Medicine. And um, if you have any questions or like to know a little bit more about... Uh, Dr. Sue Ogier, or as she liked to be called, Pharmasu, you can check her out at her website at www.pharmasu.com. All right. Hope you guys enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Capsule Arts Podcast. Today, I am one of your hosts, Dr. Joe Lozo, and today I'm with... Dr. Carmen Hernandez. And today we'll be interviewing a guest that we've never had before, a guest that is different than any guest we've ever had before. And I'm excited to announce uh, to the stage, Dr. <laughs> Sue Ojigir. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. I'm so excited for this conversation. Yes, so are we. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and say a couple cool things about Sue. So one, she's into pharmacogenomics, so we already know that we connect. <laughs> I love pharmacogenomics. And two, she has a children's book. So I'm super excited to talk about that later. It's a super cute book. She was um, kind enough to go ahead and give us a pre-order to go ahead and check it out. And that's something that if anybody has any kids, I highly, highly recommend you get the book. Teach them a little bit about pharmacy. And it's just super cute. So, like, you got to read it. Um, but before we get into all of that, can you please provide a brief introduction um, to our audience today about yourself? Sure. So I guess I would start off with saying I've been a pharmacist for about 15 years now. And my journey has mainly been in the retail space. I went to um, St. John's University in New York and currently living in Texas. I'm a mom of five kids, so definitely busy and trying to balance work life and, you know, family life, it m made me make the decision to transition out of retail and look for my calling per se, and just try to find what I'm very passionate about. And it's been such a fun adventure and I am enjoying every minute of it. Every day is different. I feel like there's so many amazing things out there to take an adventure in. And it's been quite a journey so far. Definitely. And one, just being a, a mom of any number mm -hmm. is tough, but a mom of five and you're also doing all, all the things that you're doing is definitely impressive. So we're going to need some time management skills from you before yes. the end of the day, just letting <laughs> you know now, uh, because you know, that's, that's one of the big things that we all struggle with. And the work life balance for sure, yes. because yes, yes, yes. even people like me that have no kids already have a hard time finding that. So yeah. that'll be really great advice from you. It's fun. <laughs> um, I guess once you, you're in that stage in life, you just find, you just find a way to get it done or to know instinct, like your instincts just kick in. So that's my little bit of mom advice. Okay. So to start off, can you kind of briefly describe what pharmacogenomics is and why you believe it's valuable for patient care? Pharmacogenomics or easy way PGX, um, just understanding and how to say the word. I think that's one of the biggest challenges and you know, it seems like a really very foreign topic, but we all went through it through in pharmacy school. We were all educated in pharmacogenomics when we took classes in pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics. So we have the background for it and utilizing that and putting that into practice is so beneficial for our patient care because it provides so much benefits in their outcomes. 
And it's basically the study of genetics and pharmacology and using that information to help patients get the right medicine based on their individuality. So think of it in a perspective we all can understand is we personalize everything in our life from our cars, our phones, our clothing. Why not personalize our health, our most important aspect of our health, right? And use, utilizing this technique or use, utilizing this great um, technology is so beneficial for our patient care. It should be definitely a mainstay in um, their health. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things I would say that that you mentioned that I believe is important is personalizing the healthcare experience. We all don't want to feel like we're part of the general population when it comes to our patient care, when it comes to being treated as a patient. We want to be treated, be treated special. We want to feel special. For and sure. something that pharmacogenomics allows you to do is be special as a patient and how we treat you because you and your genetics are unlike anybody else. And so that's something that I, I believe is very important and I could see it playing a role in the future. But right now, a lot of people feel like it's not the most beneficial thing, I would say, right? Um, mm-hmm. I've definitely had talks with some people in administrative positions and they like the idea of it, but it can be kind of, it can, there's some pushback, right? There's some pushback. Yeah. Have you come across like any pushback mm-hmm. with people about pharmacogenomics? Oh, yes. I think. The mainstay in um, getting resolving these issues is education. Not everyone's going to be 100% or agreeing with everything you say in the beginning, but educating um, these specific groups or populations would be the most beneficial. And that's how I started off my whole practice. I have uh, concierge services that I provide for my my, um, clients. And I started off the journey as creating small bit educational videos on my platform online. So it would give the general public or anyone who would be interested in understanding these topics a very simplified explanation that they could understand and very easy to understand terms. So anyone who's interested in medications and how they work or they're having side effects or they just have very simple questions, they could get these answers and, you know, speak to their physicians and you know, hopefully resolving these questions that they may have. As far as um, educating our practitioners, anyone who is very reluctant to starting these type of changes in their practice is giving them the scientific data, providing them with um, resources where they could get more understanding on how it's actually a viable or under or a topic that's in fact not something that's just made up, right? It's our genetics. It's something that's individualized to each patient. And we're not just making this up just for the sake of just pulling it out of thin air, right? It's, um, has a lot of research and there's, um, lots of credible studies that are done to show its effect. For, for the pharmacy listeners that are mm-hmm. listening, you know, I, I think the number one, one, the number one drug that we hear about is always plastics, right? When it comes oh, to, yeah. when it comes to our, PTY12 inhibitors and how that plays a big role with antiplatelet therapy. I think also in children, I believe it's pretty important when it comes to like CYP2D6 for, for, mm-hmm. for coding and morphine and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But what other kind of patient populations would you say pharmacogenomics is very important or valuable for? So if somebody's listening, you know, they feel like their medications aren't the best or if they take a certain medication, which patients do you believe would benefit from that type of service? You know, in the beginning when I started this process of understanding exactly how pharmacogenomics works or what exactly it is, I would start off saying that maybe if you take five or more medications, that's something to consider, or maybe you should start looking into getting a PGX test. But then I changed that. That completely changed because I believe that anyone taking any medication should definitely be able to have this information ahead of time or know how they metabolize medications because all it needs is just one adverse effect to hurt a patient. And it helps your physician knowing how to determine which class or how to properly dose and prescribe your medications in the future. And it shows a lot of benefit for like oncology patients, um, psych drugs, cardiology drugs, oncology. So there's a lot of um, disease states that benefit from PGX testing. Would you say with your experience, what patient population have you really utilized um, PGX testing? The most um, promising would be the 
mid thirties to forties. And they're fairly healthy individuals who want a better understanding of their medications and what to take a control, take control of their health. They're looking for answers or they're not getting the best treatment or they are just wanting to understand how they could be in control of their health. That's my main population base that I'm working with. And you mentioned earlier that you had like educational videos. Where can anyone that's listening access those? Yes. So this is how it all started. I started a platform online and I did it as something on the side when I was still working at retail. And I just started like maybe on one or two videos a week, uploading, just explaining like what's a refill, what's a prescription. And it started to get traction. Like there was a lot of responses and questions I would get, like maybe you know, I should continue with this um, process. So I started going a little bit more in detail and explaining on um, disease states and specifically honing down on PGX. So it's across all platforms. It's on YouTube. It's on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. And after the, the, the name of my company as well, Pharmaceu, I kept it all streamlined. Okay. <laughs> so basically at Pharmaceu. Uh-huh. Pharmaceu. Okay. okay. At any of those. Um, social media accounts, TikTok, Instagram. Yes. Do they'll be able to access any anything that that you're showing on there? Yes. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> you guys like the name? <laughs> I I actually was gonna comment about that. Yeah. I that has a really nice ring to it. Pharma Sue. Now I gotta be careful before I yeah, say yeah, yeah, Pharma yeah. Sue instead of Pharma C. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the the corniness of it, and I think it's. Uh. And it resonates with a lot of people. That's just it. Remember, right? Yeah. yeah. That's it. You know, people are going to remember. I'm going to remember. So <laughs> now, um, you know, and this field, the pharmacogenomics, I mean, it's something that is, you know, how Jovin was saying, it's, it's something so, I think, interesting. It underestimates how awesome this field is, right? So, and you know, there's a lot of people where, like you were mentioning, I work in a in a psychiatric pharmacy, so mm -hmm. I see people with the same medication. They experience different side effects, right? Yes. And ultimately, I'm sure that it ties down to their genes. Oh yes. Um, I wanted to ask, um, did you? Is there are there any like success stories that you can think of off the top of your head? I probably am putting you on the spotlight right now, but. Any success stories with a patient that, you know, you discovered that the reason why they're experiencing what they were experiencing and. Um, or they had some type of event. Right. And then you're able to identify why, even though they're taking a certain medication that should have prevented it, this mm -hmm. happened because, you know, your pharmacogenomics um, results. Oh, yes. Yeah, so many. But I think the one story that resonates throughout this all was the story I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with the mom who just recently had a baby and she was nursing baby after having, um, leaving the hospital discharge. Everything was fine for the pregnancy and delivery. And she was taking pain medicine, Tylenol with codeine. And she turned out to be a fast metabolizer of the medicine and excreted the medicine out into her breast milk. And the baby ingested this. And over time, unfortunately and tragically, baby passed away. I think that was the most, like, it hit home because it's something that's so common. You don't think twice about something like this happening, but it's such a tragic case, uh, having to deal with something like that. And it's, it puts it into perspective, like, this could, ha this could actually happen and be a detrimental side effect like that. So it's very, very scary. The ones that are the scariest are the mm -hmm. ones that are most preventable. Oh, yes. Something that with just proper lab testing. And it's like, yeah. And you don't want to get to that point where it's like, what if this was done or like what else could we have done or like it, it shouldn't get to that, especially with our patient care and our patient's health and overall how we look at this, um, how we practice as pharmacists. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you know off the top of your head? I'm, and I'm, now I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> Did they start testing mothers or children for pharmacogenomic testing after that event? Or was it more of a, let's just avoid coding in? So it's not, it depends on the, the physician and how they practice or what type of, um, criteria they're going through. But for that particular event, I don't believe that, um, in, I'm not too sure of the familiarity with the hospital, what mm -hmm. resulted in the case, but, um, it, it, 
I don't think it's a mainstay of practice now because when you're leaving that, when I had my kids, I wasn't given a PGX test or I don't know anything about my metabolism rate when I was, you know, when I had my kids and every one of my pregnancies I left with, you know, Tylenol 3. So it is, it wasn't done for me. So I don't think it's standard care. And that's where the issues, you have a lot of gaps in therapy and loopholes. You have to be able to advocate and educate your patients and let them know that these are things that we could fix with our proper education. And that's something I even think about. So now I'll have that in the back of my mind as well. And anybody that's working in retail um, that's listening, definitely kind of keep this in the back of your mind as well. If if one of your patients just had a baby and you see that they have COVID, you might want to ask them to go seek some PGX Mm -hmm. testing. From the last time I looked, I do think quite a bit of health insurances are starting to pay for it. Um, mm-hmm. the last I look. So that might be something you might be able to get covered through, um, their health insurance. So mm-hmm. that's something that, uh, that you brought up a really good point. And I just wanted to make sure we share with the audience today. Extremely. And so, no, that's a, that's a really good point. Even in retail, it will have to be something that we'll have to make some changes because I don't know how often do pharmacists ask their patient, you know, the female patients, are you pregnant? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it, only you find out through their, depending on the medications and their profile, right? So that will have to be, that will require major changes in various fields. Oh, yes. Yeah. Working um, retail, I think that definitely ignited that desire to want more and mm-hmm. to change the way we provide care because I saw so many rooms for improvement and pay, especially with patient, um, going through many side effects, duplications, like, so many areas for improvement. So we have to really, really focus on patient care and the true meaning of getting our patients to where there's, there should be a standard of care. Absolutely. No, I, I definitely agree. Um, now I, and I also, you know, talking in terms of retail, it actually reminded me how you mentioned, I believe in the beginning that you transitioned from mm-hmm. retail to pharmacogenomics. Um, how did that happen? You know, how, how was that transition? You know, I've been in retail for like about 14 years and I actually liked the entire process. I love meeting new patients. I love conversations and, and I love the busyness of the whole, you know, the surrounding. I love my technicians. It was a great environment, but throughout the the changes with COVID, I saw so much room for, for change and improvement. And I knew that if I stayed in that environment, I wasn't going to be practicing at the top of my license or I wasn't going to be using all the skills I went to school for and I have. So I was just like, do myself a disservice. So I had to get out of that environment in order to find my passion. While everything was happening with the videos and creating a platform and, you know, deciding where I want to take my career to the next level, I was recognized um, for being a pharmacy influencer. That was the other step that I think kind of springboard everything out to the next step of trying to get everything on the next level, getting the recognition and just being appreciated by my community and just, you know, realizing that, hey, maybe I should do something with this and not let it just sit in the back of my head or just let it be. So that fueled me even more to just be do something different, to find the change, right? So yeah. using that now, I said, I have to find a way to get better care for patients. So for PGX. Like, why isn't this put into place? Or why isn't this like standard care? Why does anyone know about this? Like, we know like little bits and pieces of it, but not the general public and not even our physicians or like our doctors that we go, we we barely spend about 15 minutes in the room with them and they're not fully educated, understanding how to incorporate this into their system. So there needs to be a change and they have to understand how to use this in their practice. So that led to one one thing left to the next and it started to grow. And then I started working with um, practitioners and building out collaborative practices with them and implementing them the services as well into their um into their practice. So it's definitely a lot of benefits there in that um aspect. About how long would you say it took? That sounds like a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> So surprisingly, no, not at all. Because I think once you're in the momentum, you just 
you just follow your the next step. You just go after it. You just find the desire to want a change and you're not going to stop until you get there. So I would say it's been about a year and a half. A year and a half. Uh You just have to be open to finding an opportunity and be very receptive to what's out there. If you're going to want a change, you have to be very willing to look at things in a different light, in a different scope. So a lot of self-development. So it's not easy changing that mindset because as pharmacists, we're very we were, we try to stay comfortable and you have to not be comfortable. That's one of the hardest things I had to learn. And, you know, just getting over your own self doubt and being very positive, even through the negative, you're going to have some tough times, but you definitely have to work through it and just try to find the light at the end of the tunnel. And remember why you're doing it in the first place, because, Hey, um, if you don't really fight for what you want or you're not, you're just going to be miserable where you're, where you're at so you have to want that change and let me ask you uh, how long were you working in retail before you realized you wanted to be the chain you know what you wanted to get involved in pharmacogenomics? mix so it was 14 years in total in retail and it started around the time of covid like something changed i think that everyone goes through that it, it's funny because everyone I'm meeting and, you know, connecting with, I think we all had that change in mindset or wanted something different around the same time, age, time um frame. So there's something that happens where your mind just changes and it says, I'm not happy where I am and I have to change or else I'm just going to be miserable and stuck and just complain about the entire process along the way or I have to change. So. It changed probably, I think, around year 12. It probably should have been a lot sooner, but I think I held myself back a lot too because I wanted to be comfortable. You want to take the easy route. You know you have something very stable, even though there's a lot of challenges. You're holding on to the comfortable feeling and suppressing all of those emotions because you want to be comfortable where you are. But you have to be able to want the change and fight for it because if you stay comfortable, it's not going to benefit anyone, especially um, our patients. You said something that was powerful. Mindset shift that mm-hmm. you need to do is what led you to where you're at now. And oh, yes. The one thing mm-hmm. that everybody in pharmacy has to go through because we have to go through a pharmacy shift. We mm-hmm. have to shift when we go from student when we go from undergrad to graduate school, when we go from graduate school to rotations, when we go from rotations going into either the workforce or a residency or a fellowship and, and starting to practice as a pharmacist, then going into, all right, now I'm a preceptor or going into an administrator role. So I get a lot of those questions about the mind shift. I get mm-hmm. questions about imposter syndrome from, from some of our fans and some of mm-hmm. our friends. Mm-hmm. What did you use? to help change your mindset. I know there's always a pinpoint. There's, and we don't have to dive into that. Yes. Uh, if it's like a personal reason. Yeah. But I know there's always, cause I can think of myself, like there's a, there's a specific moment where like enough is enough and you, you want to make that change. But even within that process of making the change, I'm sure there's things, whether it's reading a book, whether it's, you know, mm-hmm. affirmations that you wrote down, whether it's journaling. What are some tools that you use to help you that maybe our listeners can apply to their daily development to help them create also create that mind shift? Oh yes, that's a hundred percent. I could not agree with you even more with that because I personally went through um, many changes to get me where I am today. You're not going to be able to get where you are unless you go through experience in life. And one of the quotes I always refer back to is school. You're taught a lesson and given a test, and in life, you're given a test and then taught a lesson. That, I think, is a very, very powerful quote that sums up, I think, most of our experience in life. And you have to be able to understand what that means on a deeper level to really use your experiences and everything you went through in life and do something with that. Because... Everything happens for a reason, I believe, and we have to take all our experiences and learn from it. And failure, surprisingly, is one of the greatest lessons that I found 
And I teach my kids that I, you know, I have that as one of the driving forces that I use as well, because you could just throw your hands up and just give up and like, oh, well, I'll, I'll just keep on being comfortable and just go on with life. Or you could use that and just fuel you to do something else because that's how you progress and that's how you build yourself as a human and you get to the next level. So that has definitely been one of the the things that you have to reprogram your brain to understand. Like you're going to have failures. You have to just change the way you think and use that as fuel to get to the next level. And personally, one of the books I always, you know, go back to is The Power of the Subconscious Mind. I love that book because you you put out energy in this world and you have like positive affirmations. If you want something bad enough, you'll fight for it and you'll get it. But if you just have like a regular nonchalant attitude about it, it's it's not going to it's not you're not going to manifest it. And it seems very silly like when you're, you're actually saying it, but it's it's true. And when you write something down, you wholeheartedly believe in it. It'll it'll come true. Like you just have to want that change for yourself and fight for it because you'll, you'll get there. Definitely. And I want to pull up that book. We got to have a book club. I, we really do. We, we need to add a book club. I have, I'm writing out, I need to write it down because it's by, I'm not, yeah. it's by Joseph Murphy, The Power of Your yes. Conscious Mind. The Power of Conscious Mind. And it's so funny because I remember that book from like way back when I was in pharmacy school and my husband told me, you know, read this. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to read a book about telling <laughs> you. Like, I'm going to do good in this test. And, but you have to be able to understand. You can't tell someone to do something. Like, you personally have to have that, that drive and you have to have that, that will and that power to do, make change. And once you understand that concept, anything's possible. And I wholeheartedly just go by that. And I just, try to practice that and try to incorporate in my daily life. And so far it's not going to win and you know, everything's going good so far. <laughs> Amazing. And you know, and just to add another point, um, mm-hmm. like I, I also asked you that question about how long were you in retail before you had that mindset change. Mm-hmm. Right. And the reason I ask is because I think, you know, and I was a student not too long ago and um, I, as a student, I was always like, my mind was always running as to what do I want to do? Where should I go work at? What should I do residency? And it's like, I felt like I needed to figure it out right then and there. And mm-hmm. as you, as from your experience, you know, you can start in one place and then eventually end up somewhere else, you know, so yes. that's happened in one year, two years, three years. 12 years, 14 years. But I think it's very important for us to as well keep an open mind and think that, hey, at any time in our lives, things can change and for the better. So like us as students, we can't, we we should start somewhere, right? But then it doesn't always mean that's where we're going to end up at for the rest of our lives. Oh, yes, that's so true. I mean, you need the experiences for one and you need to like meet everyone in your journey, like they have a purpose and they're going to teach you something along this um, journey. So soak in all that information and go through each phase in your life and career and just be receptive of all that information that's coming in because it does play a part in your, where you're going to, what you're going to build or what you're expecting. So never, I, I would never say, or I never recommend to anyone like, Hey, you're doing pharmacy right now. Would you ever choose something else? I love being a pharmacist, regardless of like what's going on in our profession or what everyone would say about it or all the negativity we hear in the media and with everything, right? I always recommend it because there's so much opportunity in this field. You just have to find it, find what you love and just go with it and just build it out to its potential. And it'll be amazing. She is so passionate. <laughs> I, know. I, know. I, I, I wish everybody could see how big she's smiling right now. She is so passionate about what she's doing. Those are goals for sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you guys remember the article from um a couple of was was it a month ago? Um, where they were like, "There's a shortage of pharmacists," and like yeah. everyone I was just like, "There's no shortage of pharmacists." There's like, 
there's just pharmacists doing something that they're passionate about now. And there are different areas that we're working on and different aspects of care that we're providing. So there's so many areas that, that exist out there that not everyone is aware of. There's our very common ones, the retail community, hospital. We know those, right? But there's so many different areas you could divert into and focus and put our energy in. So it's the possibilities are endless. Definitely. And that's something that I always tell people. That's the beauty of pharmacy is that whatever you're into, you can find a position. in. If you love technology, you can be an IT pharmacist. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long that became a a thing, but that is a real thing. And it's still something that's so needed. So yeah, yeah. and it's it's a field that's growing (laughs) and it's needed. Mm -hmm. And same thing with industry. If, if you, desire to work in marketing. You could be a marketing pharmacist when it comes to the drug commercials and whatnot. If you want to be with medical writing, you can do that. There's so many different things that you can do that's outside of the box. But a lot of times, even as myself, thinking back a couple of years ago as a student, I didn't, I wasn't privy mm-hmm. to all the different opportunities and how to get there. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted you on today. And I wanted to ask you your opinion on what is the best yeah. way for a pharmacy student to possibly get involved in pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics and the getting involved with that is just connecting with your peers that's out there. Join LinkedIn, join communities or ask questions because there's a lot of possibilities and lots of venues and avenues you could take to just build what you want out of it. And there are certification programs. I, I particularly, I did one, um, I did PGX 101 and it was great. I loved it. And. I wanted to learn more or see what else I could do with that. So I joined um, PGX um, Confidence Academy with Jamie Wilkie. And that just took it to a whole new level. Like I met pharmacists in this space that are doing so many amazing things. And just the brainstorming and coming up with so many ideas. Like you run out of ideas just with so many ideas that you have because you have to write everything down because the possibilities are endless. And that's how I... um I I would say just that alone has added more more fuel to like getting me to where I am as well. And it's funny, you mentioned medical writing. One of the speakers I met through that course, he's actually a medical writer that, that sparked interest. So it became certified as a medical writer. Having that, I was like, okay, maybe I could do something for the medical end and just writing. And that's, I guess, kind of how I probably started the children's book or had the background of starting very simple with my medical writing. And, you know, you, if you could tell in the book, it's nowhere like journals are very scientific. It's very simple layman's terms. Dr. Seuss, like you said, and it was, you know, everything plays a part in your journey. So be receptive to that information and what anyone says, but also be, um, cognizant of like the next negative information you get. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to discourage you, but take in information, but also know how to filter it as well. Because, yeah. you know, there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of information that could get misconstrued. Someone's advice could be taken the wrong way, or you just have to know how to process it and you decide how to, where to go from there. And something you mentioned, I believe very important, and I want to talk about it a little bit is, is you mentioned that you started surrounding yourself with like-minded people who were going for whatever they're going for and they helped inspire you and spark things within yourself to do things. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about the importance of either applying for certification or going to conferences or these different events and the value that it's brought to you to maybe inspire some of these students listening or some of these pharmacists listening to go to these events Mm -hmm. and start networking? Definitely. That's such a big, that plays such a big part in, you know, shaping and defining your, your career. Networking, it's, it's making a comeback. It's no longer virtual. COVID's over, you know, so we're having a lot more in-person events. So be, if you're able to join or participate, definitely go. It's, it's amazing at these events because you connect with, regardless if it's a, in the same field where you're in or if it's a different field, you'll just, make connections with someone and you explain to them what you're doing and they'll connect you with someone else. So networking is big. And if you can do in person, definitely my biggest one would be LinkedIn. I, I love LinkedIn. As you can tell, I've met so many. (laughs) 
It, it's great. I mean, I started off on like Instagram and Facebook, but it takes it to a whole new level on LinkedIn. Like you could really connect with amazing people out there and they're doing some awesome things. So that's like, that's the coolest spot so far. Is there any pharmacogenomic conferences or annual meetups? I, I'm not too sure. So I just want to ask. Yeah. There, there was one just recently, um, in Orlando where they had it for, uh, UF. So that's, um, and they have, you know, periodically there's, I mean, it's throughout the world. So there's a lot of different conferences, a lot of, um, professionals from all different areas coming together and, um, you know, sharing the knowledge. So there's, um, it's funny that you mentioned the conferences or research. Um, I had a trip back in, the, over the summer and we went to DC with the kids and we went through the Smithsonian, of course, because it's amazing there, right? Yeah. yeah. And one of the exhibits in one of the museums, it was from the NIH, the yeah, National so Institute of Health. Yeah. And they had the human genome project. I absolutely geeked out. <laughs> <laughs> it became a trip for you now. <laughs> right. I was taking pictures with the like the helix and like playing around with all the exhibits and the kids were like, okay, can we can go look at that? I'm like, no, 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 I need to take a picture here. Yeah. I need to do that. And it's so funny how, you know, manifesting things, how we were saying before, right? And mm -hmm. actually working with on a project with them for one of their newer research programs. Um, it's called All of Us, collecting data from all different nationalities throughout the US mm -hmm. and using that information to help determine how environment, your health and your background. So it all plays together. But it's funny how, you know, I was there at that moment and that time. And I wouldn't think about ever doing something that grand scale or that large and putting the energy out there and it just becomes a reality, right? Yeah. I wish it was easier for other things like the lottery, but, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, the way you're going. You know, yeah. I'm happy about yeah. it. I'm sure you can achieve yeah. it. <laughs> and I told the kids, I was like, guys, do you remember when we were there? And it was like, you know, the, um, the human genome project and they were looking at me with like, Oh geez, she's going to start again. <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's funny how everything plays a part and it just comes together and it, it happens for a reason. I'm like big on that. Everything happens for a reason in life and you just look at everything, try to look at it in the positive light and, you know, just go with the flow. Yeah. One day, the next. Exactly. Exactly. One day at a time. Yeah. And so. All of these experiences, going to a different conference, going to different events, you meet somebody who's a medical writer, then you get certified in that or licensed in that, and then that kind of sparks the children's book. Mm -hmm. This is this is the most important part of the, of the, of the podcast. <laughs> this is the most important part of the episode. All right. So we diverted a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, yes, we did, but it was all to get here to this right. point, to this, to this well, point. Everything happened for a reason. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the book is titled The Farmer Heroes, The Power of Precision Medicine. Mm -hmm. We all love heroes. Mm -hmm. We all love a good story. And we all love a rhyme book. Mm -hmm. So please talk to us about this awesome book. Sure. So this project started around Christmas of last year. And I was coming up with our, you know, gift and trying to figure out what I'm going to give to the kids or what we're going to do. So. I see them making their list and, you know, pages and their want, like all their wants and everything. So I change it up this year. I'm like, I'm going to write a book and gift it to you guys, or we're going to work on this project and we're going to see it from start to completion. And that's going to be your gift. And we put all of our energy in it. Like we, like I wanted their input and I wanted them to proofread it or just like read it and see if it made sense because I wanted, and the mainstay of the book is explaining PGX to kids and adults in a language that's understood by kids. So it's a children's book, but it's a book that could be read, you know, by adults and it could explain the basic concepts of PGX because it is a complex topic, right? And mm -hmm. if you could understand it, then I think we could kind of understand as adults the basic concepts underlying um what what exactly is PGX. So we started, I guess the time frame would be early December and completion would be up to February. So it's been all of my energy been focused on getting that completed and I'm I'm really excited of the way it came out and I think 
from start to completion, it's one of the ones I'm most excited about. You should be, for one. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it's, it's an awesome project, and it's so different. Mm-hmm. It's extremely colorful, people. It is super cute. I'm trying to think of how I would describe it. <laughs> I, I feel like it's... When I first was looking at it, I was like, oh, I'm getting like King Arthur vibes, because we have the castle. I uh-huh. you, that was Merlin in the beginning. I wasn't sure. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to spill too much, too much of the beans, but it's just like, it's, it's truly a children's book and they'll enjoy not only the rhyme scheme, but also how colorful it is, mm-hmm. how detailed the pictures are. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sure this process, you just talked about it. It took a while, took some time, took a lot of efforts. Uh, mm-hmm. to- um, but you said that you kind of had like all hands on deck with that. Did you have your children play a little bit of a role with anything as far as like maybe like, um, coloring or any of the, the, the human depictions, anything like that? So the cover, it has, um, a picture of the heroes. They're actually the kids. So I have one girl and four boys. So I wanted them to be incorporated into the story. So when they read through the book, they're going to like, Oh, that's me over there. Or that's me. And the boys kind of all look alike, so they they were like arguing like which one's which, but they're basically you know <laughs> that is so adorable. <laughs> so that's how I incorporated them and try to get them excited about it with them being in the book, so they'll get like engaged throughout the process. So, and you're right. So the you, that's a good pickup that you got with the the whole feel of the book, yeah. wanting to be like the middle like a middle ages or yes, very the middle ages. Right. Oh, so it's very, uh, it takes you, like, it has that comforted feeling of that typical fairy tale like story. So it does have that nostalgia there. So that's definitely, um, an element that I wanted to keep throughout the story and the rhyme scheme because the rhyming is definitely engaging and it keeps you wanting to read more and figure out what's going on. So that was a big part of it. And as far as the illustrations, I'm not going to take credit for that. That was Fiverr. I went on Fiverr and I looked for an illustrator and people out there are really talented. I'll definitely say that. I mean, there's so many amazing talent out there and you find the right gig and just, you know, explain what you're looking for. And I went through the process. We had a back and forth. We had the draft, the revisions, and I think we nailed it down to a point, just getting exactly where it wanted to be. Yeah, definitely. And that, that's something I try to talk to other entrepreneurs about sometimes. You need to oh, do yeah. some consultant work. You need to outsource some things. It mm-hmm. can't always be you. Uh, a lot. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And I know you kind of touched upon this, but just in case there's anything else you wanted to say, um, what are some of the main takeaways that you had for this book? For the book, the takeaway would be just understanding the concept of what PGX is because like I said, it is a complex topic and not many people are, are aware of it. So breaking it down and making it understandable to kids and adults is the biggest takeaway and how we can incorporate it into our practice and use it in our everyday life. And another idea that I kind of work in the behind the scenes is creating a series with them. I was going to ask if there was more coming. Because I can, uh, I can see the way it ended that, that you kind of left some. For, for another, for another, uh, you know, so, yeah. something else, right? To be continued or where does it, where does it end or Medville? Does something else happen in Medville, right? Yeah. So I'm working on creating or like a children's series or taking it to different aspects of pharmacy where the hero's still there, but explaining other areas. I mean, I love PGX, but I mean, it all comes together. It's not just PGX, it's cardiology, respiratory. It's all systems that play together and should work together when providing care for our patients. It's not just one area alone. So having a pharmacist explain that in their perspective and very simplified terms does help a lot, especially for kids and adults as well. Yeah, and I, and I could see how you can spin into a lot of different Fields, especially with infectious disease, I think we could touch upon a lot of different <laughs> stories, a lot of different powerful, like playful kid stories that you could use with different disease states and how that, that would be not only a fun way for them to learn mm-hmm. as a child, but also a interesting way for the adult to learn about. Oh, yeah. That's something that, you know, we're all passionate about is making sure that our patients 
and even within our patients, just the general population have are more knowledgeable about healthcare topics. Oh yes, for sure. And something that I we didn't get a chance to ask you, but I wanted to ask you about because I did some research. I always do my googles. <laughs> uh, you're also involved a little bit in holistic health, correct? Yes. How did you get involved with that? It, holistic health and my the way I incorporate holistic health or how I try to practice it or in, in, um, help my patients is letting them know or explain to my clients and patients that there's not a pill for every single disease state. So just because you're sick shouldn't be another medicine or just throwing medications in the whole mix. There's not a pill for an ill, like every, in every instance. And it's funny when I was back in <clears throat> retail, everyone would joke because most of my recommendations would be ginger ale for whenever someone would come up for a question like, Oh, my stomach hurts. Are you going to recommend ginger ale? Like that was my, the answer for almost all the questions out there. And then right, the most of the population is geared to wanting to treat something with another medicine or treating with medicine. And that's where all the side effects comes in, like where everything is just piled on, on like you're just treating another side effect with another medication, dealing with the side effects with another and just pill overload. So just educating our patients and getting them to advocate for themselves and understanding that not every ailment needs to be treated with medicine. Yes, medicine is definitely important and needed in certain cases and instances, but understand the root cause of our illness and getting to the bottom line. And there's a lot of things you could do holistically, um, you know, changing your diet, sleep, exercise that you could do to help, you know, with better health. So would you say, what would be, I guess, some, if you could provide some tips to our audience, because mm-hmm. I know I get access a lot. I don't know if you do, whether it's from family members or mm-hmm. um, oh, while yes. working, Carmen. Okay. Mm-hmm. They're always asking about some holistic mm-hmm. things that they can do over the mm-hmm. counter, herbal teas, herbal products. Is there any of them that just through your experience you found beneficial mm-hmm. and for what indication or what purpose did you find that herbal product beneficial? Oh, yes. Yeah. So Ginger, of course. one mainstay I would say is gut health, understanding and getting to a lot of our uh, ailments and problems that we go through are a lot dependent on gut health. And once you maintain that or you have proper control through probiotics or right, right vitamins, you could definitely take control of that and um, help with a lot of different um, health conditions. And one of the one of the companies I do work with, um, Pure Encapsulation, I love their brand. It's a really good, reputable brand, and um, I, I recommend to all my patients and and it's definitely one of the mainstays and getting to the root cause of a lot of issues and just explaining that whole process and understanding inflammatory um, foods and different things that we eat and ingest and sleep is another big factor. I mean, we, that's so underrated. Like if you're, if you don't have proper enough sleep, it messes up a lot of things. And when we were, I felt this a lot more when I was younger, I was like, okay, I could pull all nighters and do you know, really late nights. As I got older, you feel it. Like the next day, everything's messed up. Everything's like foggy. You have to like, yeah, break anything or do anything. It's only good for a certain amount of time. But after that, no, you got to focus on your health and go back to the basics. You need your sleep, good food, and that's basics. Definitely. And then I feel like we're all over the place this episode, but I, I love these type of episodes because yes. it's going to work Um, it's going to be a pain to edit though. But, uh, how do you balance health and work? Because you're doing so many different things. Mm-hmm. A lot of our listeners are trying to figure out how to juggle the different tasks, whether it's rotations, residency, work, family life, all, all encompassing everything under the sun. Mm-hmm. How did you find a way to maintain that balance and do it in a healthy manner? I actually had a very interesting conversation (laughs) recently. And having a sedentary life, especially with all the work from home jobs, you see such how much of an impact that has in your life. If you don't move and you stay like if you sit all day and you're very, you know, not 
you're, you're stuck to the desk or your job just requires you to just be very immobile, right? That plays a big factor in your overall health. Always be on the move. And I follow this one person online and one of the quotes that I always remember, motion is the new lotion or something like that. That was one of the cool things I always remember. Like you're, you need it for not for only thing, your joints, but your heart health. You need to always be up and moving and just, just be active, take care of your health overall and just be up and just move, do some cardio. You don't have to go all the way out and just, you know, burn every fat or just they look at it like that, but just always be on the move and just try to be active. It involves some type of motion and movement. And it's funny because I would sometimes say to myself, like, you know, was I healthier when I was back in retail because I would always be running around and getting my steps in. And now that I'm just more uh, like at home or doing more, um, not as crazy busy pace of, you know, running around, like I have to try to incorporate and force myself to always be up and just go for those scheduled walks and making sure I'm getting, I walk in and just exercising. So that's one of the things, I guess, one of the, be- um, the benefits of retail. <laughs> You're always getting your movement in. Yep. Always moving around. Not, not too much sitting down. Um, right. <laughs> like I sit down too much. So I always have to go for scheduled walks. And that's something that I, I also do. Yeah. And schedule it. Block up some time, your schedule. You got to make it a priority. Oh, well, okay. yes. All right. And so did you have any questions for us? Um, no, so far so good. I'm just so so excited. (laughs) I mean, I mean, I guess overall to wrap up, I mean, I, I, this has been amazing. I mean, I, I'm mind blown too. So (laughs) conversation, Uh, I love it. (laughs) So I guess overall, you know, just to summarize for our viewers, um, what are three to five takeaway points that you want to give to our audience today about Either pharmacogenomics or holistic health or both. So I would say as if you're listening and you're a pharmacist and my main takeaway from this is remember why you became a pharmacist and don't, don't give the weird answer is like, Oh, I did it because of money. Find the true reason why you did it and just go for that reason and focus on that. And you'll build something amazing if you focus on the true reason of why you decide to do this. And if you're listening as a student, continue doing what you're doing. You're just going to go through experiences. It's going to be tough. It's going to be lots of bumps on the road, but each bump is going to teach you something and it's going to be an amazing journey. Just follow through and you'll find your passion if you're passionate about it. So never stay if you're in a position or a place that you're not happy keep on searching and looking and eventually you'll get there. And if you don't get there, just build it out yourself and you'll find and you'll meet people along the way and ask questions. Definitely be open and receptive to meeting new people, connecting and learning because life is always a journey that you need to learn from and take away information from. And if you're a bystander, um, know that there's a lot of opportunities to educate yourselves out there Get yourselves to the right place that you want to be. You define what you want is healthy and strive for that and look for answers and advocate for your health because it's your, if you don't have your health, you won't have anything. Your health is your wealth. Focus on that. That's exactly what I was thinking when you said it. Health is wealth. Health is wealth. Thank you so much. That was it for the questions we had today. It was very eye opening, very transparent, very informational. And I believe something that will be very beneficial to the audience, especially since residency match days are on the corner, especially since now is the time people are searching for jobs, people are making transitions in their career, and maybe they could use this as a stepping stone to finding their purpose, finding their passion, using some of the tools that you talked about, maybe reading the book that you recommended. So The Power of Your Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy, um, definitely accessing any of your YouTube content, your Instagram content, your content on LinkedIn as well, TikTok, etc. Another thing you mentioned was you just can't be comfortable. You have mm-hmm. to be uncomfortable. And I always tell people you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable if you yes. truly want to grow. Yes. If you just stay in the same space, you don't change anything. How can you grow as a person, as a partner, as a friend, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So you have to sometimes put yourself in uncomfortable situations, take those lessons, learn from it, 
and then continue to execute and repeat. It's a cycle. It's a circle of life. And you want to always make sure that you're doing things to improve yourself, not only in a work sense, but also in a mental, emotional, and spiritual sense. And so that's something that I thought was also powerful that you mentioned. And I just wanted to make sure we, we I said that before we ended today. I loved our conversation. <laughs> Me too. I loved it. This has been, this is going to be, I'm telling you, I mean, I'm not, not just that, the truth. Like our, my, our listeners are going to love it. I mean, they're going to listen to it over and over. And so, uh, before we let you go, I just wanted to ask you, what is the best way for our audience and our listeners today to get in contact with you? So you could find me on my website, pharmasu.com. P-H-A-R-M-A-S-U-E dot com. And you could either email me there or reach me through all my different social media contacts as well. I am on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, <laughs> and they're all pharmacy. So any one of those means I'll definitely reach out, but email is probably the best because it'll come up right away. Info at pharmacy dot com. And also the book. The book. Um, how can everybody that's listening, if they want to purchase the book, how can they access it? Sure. So that's going to be available for sale on March 20th on Amazon. And it's also available world, uh, worldwide as well on different platforms, Barnes and Noble, um, all the different areas that throughout the world, the different, um, platforms as well, but mainly Amazon.com. You could, um, find it there. Perfect. So March 20th is when it comes out. You can get it, um, Amazon. For the book, uh, I'm forgetting the complete title. I know it's the Pharma Heroes. Um, medicine. Yes. 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 So and it's definitely. available to order right now as well on the digital, um, copy, but after March 20th, all digital, paperback and hardcover. Yeah. And is there also like an audible book component to it? I'm working on that. That's actually <laughs> another back end project as well. Okay. Keep, keep the kids entertained while you're driving the car. So, you know, we want to make sure they're good. There might be something with me reading the book as a bedtime story as well. So stay tuned. Ooh, I like that. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And then more coming soon, right? To be continued. Yes. Leaving yeah. it as an open chapter, see where this goes and, you know, just be receptive of what, what flows, what works. If it doesn't work, you know, on to the next project. Definitely. Definitely. All right. So thank you so much. So definitely go ahead and reach out to her on her website. I'll go ahead and put that in the show notes. I'll also go ahead and put in, um, I'll try to find the link on Amazon and go ahead and put it in. If the link's not out there, just know it's March 20th on Amazon. You can search for the book and I'll make sure to include the book title in there as well for anybody that's listening. If you want to go ahead and get a copy of the book. So thank you so much, guys. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Incredible, incredible jury that you just took us on. Um, and yeah, just thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's been a phenomenal episode. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one.